name is Emily Ionelli, and I'm a male to female transgender woman. And I'm going to talk about something that not many transgender girls talk about. But for me, it seems like a, a good, good um, logical point of view that uh, I believe is very important um, in uh, discussing. And the premise of this video is strictly my own opinion. You know, I'm not an expert, and certainly I don't uh, profess to be. But I know from growing up and the struggles that I faced what it was like for me. Now, if you look at many videos on YouTube uh, from the point of view of transgender girls or transgender women. You'll see a lot of videos about them talking about transitioning and being on hormone replacement therapy and the changes that they're encountering over a period of time. And you'll see videos about voice training and how to develop a feminine voice. And you'll see videos about um, discussions on uh, being pre-op or post-op and the uh, discussions about plant surgeries or post-surgeries, whether it's gender reassignment surgery or um, breast augmentation surgery or facial feminization surgery or... Um, the tracheal shave surgery or even vocal cord surgery. There's a lot of things to discuss from the point of view of a transgender girl, obviously. And uh, I think from the point of a male transitioning to a uh, female, it's a daunting task. It's not easy. It's a very intimidating process and you really have to be psychologically fit to transition and um, you have to have a, a strong need to transition and it's got to be something that you put all your energies into. And, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. That's, you know, what gave me the courage to begin my own transition from male to female. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to all the transgender girls out there that share their experiences and discuss their uh, feelings about their own personal uh, transitions. I think it's awesome. And I am very proud of each and every one of the trans girls. And I admire them. And they're my role models, to be honest with you. But in viewing many... Oh, and another issue that I've seen on transgender girl videos are discussions about depression and suicide ideation and uh, feelings of uh, family not accepting them. You know, I've seen videos on transgender girls just starting their transition. I've seen videos of transgender girls who have completed their transition. And to be honest with you, I don't know if you really ever complete your transition. Uh, from my perspective, I believe that your transition is ever evolving. You never really finish it per se. You may have the gender reassignment surgery and the breast augmentation surgery if you feel that's necessary. But I don't believe that's the end all. Uh, certainly you're still evolving and growing as a person and now you're facing the world as a new person in your new gender and um, 
I think your journey, to be honest, is just beginning. But that's my point of view. Now, there are two issues that I think are very important. And the, the one issue, because I eventually want to have gender reassignment surgery. And, you know, I have already even initiated the process. But I have hit a roadblock because I go to a therapist and a psychiatrist. And according to the Harry Benjamin standards of care, for uh, doctors to take you seriously and to consider you for surgery, you need to have two letters from health professionals that state clearly that you have gender dysphoria and in their professional opinion that you should definitely have surgery to bring your mind in tune to your body. You know, it's to that, to that um, uh, idea, however you want to say it. Um, you know what I'm trying to say though. And I am definitely a candidate. I struggle with my gender since I was three. You know, I didn't know it was called gender dysphoria, but I definitely knew I had a problem. And I hid, and I never told anybody. And I never gone to therapy until my mid early 30s. And even then, when I went to therapy, it really wasn't that helpful. But it did uh, lead me to meet my wife, which was a good thing. Um, but I've been in the hospital on many occasions for depression. I am diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I have bouts with suicide ideation. And obviously I have gender dysphoria uh, and gender identity disorder. So um, I was uh, reaching out to my therapist who I still go to and my psychiatrist who I still go to. And I asked them if they could write me a letter because the insurance company, the health insurance company that I'm working with, and Dr. Marcy Bauer's office in California, who I'm hoping would be my surgeon, need the two letters. And I'm not in any way uh, near that um, <clears throat> it's not hopeful right now. My psychiatrist and my therapist clearly stated that my recent uh, stays in the hospital within the last year have been numerous and their concern for my mental welfare. So unfortunately they are not giving me the, the go ahead for surgery and it really is making me depressed and upset because you know there's only a certain time frame that the insurance company will keep the claim open and you know the doctor's office will eventually close the case so I'm very perplexed and I'm very depressed about it and you know I, I've struggled with my gender since I was a little kid and you know I am desperate to be me to be happy you know I'm married I have a wife I have a son who I love dearly and my son is a great kid he's 16 he's autistic too and he's very understanding and we have a wonderful relationship and he knows what's going on. He's smart. And he's also very sympathetic and 
very empathetic. Um, you know, I was very excited about the prospects of the surgery because Dr. Marcy Bowers does accept insurance out of network. And, you know, I was on the phone with her staff. And then all of a sudden I hit this roadblock. And uh, I'm just like, I'm not going to say I'm devastated. But I, I just feel like all the struggle that I've been through, all the depression, and I, I, to be honest, I'm very proud that I'm a dad. And, you know, I have no ill feelings towards being a guy, a male. I mean, I lived to be a male for 50 years of my life. You know, I'm not going to just throw that away. But the reality is that I really didn't feel like a male. I was a girl trapped in a boy's body. I was a female trapped in a male's body. I was a woman trapped in a man's body. You've heard it all. It's the same thing. And I tried to reconcile that. And I lived in denial. You know, I thought that I was... You know, I could beat it, or whatever. How do you say beat it? I don't know. You know, I, I hoped at some point that it would go away, those feelings I had. And, you know, it was just very, very hard for me to cope and do what was expected. You know, I, I was very good growing up and you know I was a good son I had two sisters I love my two sisters I had wonderful parents I love and love them I miss them they're gone I um, I studied hard I was good in sports you know I did all the things that boys were supposed to do then I went from high school to college, studied hard. I buried myself in the books. You know, and then I graduated and went on to, to work. And, you know, I did what a man was supposed to do. You know, and, you know, I was very shy, you know. I didn't really have many relationships, if any. Actually, my wife was really my only girlfriend. And uh, we dated a short time before we decided to marry. And shortly thereafter, we had our son. My wife got pregnant. And we were very happy. And I thought, you know, there's hope that I won't have to deal with those feelings anymore. I literally thought that, you know, I'm a... I'm a husband now, uh, I, I'm a, I have a career, I have a son now, so I thought, you know, things look great, and we were planning to buy a house, and, you know, everything looked fantastic, and then, um, my son got a diagnosis of autism, he was around two and a half. And that was the start of things unraveling because I was getting stressed between work, between trying to find the right medical care that he needed. He was placed in early intervention. He had uh, lots of occupational therapy, a lot of language therapy. Uh, he had teachers coming to the house, you know, we had many doctor visits, we went to many uh, parent support group meetings, and, uh, you know, eventually, the combination of my worries for my son, and my uh, pressures at work, led me to start cross-dressing. 
cross-dressed in quite a few years. Actually, uh, <clears throat> the last time I had cross-dressed before I got married was probably, uh, I don't even remember. But, you know, I was cross-dressing all throughout my life, basically. And then when I met my wife, I tried to tone it down. And I guess you would, I would say that since I had met her, I really tried to clamp it and not do it. And I was afraid anyway. I was afraid she'd catch me somehow. But the combination of all those stress factors led me back to cross-dressing. And then, uh, I went back and forth with it, you know, I, I, it waned. There were times when I did it quite often. I even dressed underneath my suit and tie. And then other times I suppressed it. And as the years went by, were so worried about Matthew's situation that we kind of lost focus and our relationship, uh, the intimate part, kind of weathered away. Uh, my wife wasn't interested in having any other children, so that put some pressures on me. And I, I found myself drawn to the dressing again quite often just to uh, deal with the sexual pressures. <clears throat> and uh, I actually felt very happy inside. And then I started to go on the internet and I came upon a website called crossdressers.com. Uh, I, I found it to be very helpful you know nobody knew that I was on that site but I found it to be a place where I could go to share my experiences and to read others that were in the same boat as I was now when you think about cross-dressing and transgender, they're interrelated, but a cross-dresser is totally opposite to a transgender woman. A cross-dresser is someone who is typically a heterosexual male who is married, most likely, and has a career, who dresses to, for fun, or to relieve stress. A transgender woman is someone who also dresses, however, when they dress, it's for them, it's their identity. It's part of who they are. Now, I always tried to believe that I was just a cross-dresser. But I lived in denial because I really knew what I truly was, was a transgender woman, but I was afraid of the consequences to come out and profess that I was transgender. I knew I was, I wasn't knowledgeable of transgender as a teenager. But I was knowledgeable of transsexualism. And I learned about Dr. Harry Benjamin. 
and I learned about Dr. Renee Richards, and I learned about Christine Jorgensen, and uh, fashion models that were born male who became female and became very popular fashion models. I think uh, Tula, or T Tula? No, I don't remember. Uh, there was very famous models, I just don't remember their names. And they were very beautiful. Carol Cossie, maybe? I think, Carol Cossie. But anyway, I did a lot of reading about that. And I was only 12 or 13 at the time. So I didn't know gender dysphoria. I didn't know transgender, but I knew transsexualism. And when I read those stories, it really struck me. And it res resonated within my soul. And I truly believed at that young age that I was transsexual. A male to female transsexual. And I was cross-dressing all throughout my teenage years. You know, I used to wear girls' clothes underneath my boy clothes. Or I used to go to bed under the covers with a dress on. So I struggled for a lifetime with uh, my gender issues, uh, my gender dysphoria. So, when I spoke to my therapist and my psychiatrist about my background, and I told them that I knew that I was transgender from a very young age. I am very frustrated that they can't make a connection to the depression that I suffer from. Because depression is linked to your gender dysphoria. I am depressed for two reasons. I'm not working, so I have financial problems. I'm threatened uh, with the loss of my house to foreclosure. And if it wasn't for my son's social security fund that he gets, he's entitled to because I'm on social security disability, I wouldn't be able to catch up on my mortgage. And I had to take that pressure away, otherwise I would have wound up possibly committing suicide. I mean, I just can't take that kind of pressure anymore. So that landed me in the hospital several times. So now the psychiatrist and the therapist are using that as a hesitation for writing this, these two letters that I need. And I, I can understand it from their perspective, but they have to realize that my depression has to do uh, with financial and it has to do with my gender dysphoria. And also, I have bipolar disorder. So, I am in a catch-22 situation. And I really don't know what to do about it. I mean, I've been reaching out to therapists, trying to find someone that I could talk to about my gender. But each therapist I go to, I have to see them for at least a year. It's ridiculous. So... I don't know if there are other transgender girls that are in a similar situation as I am. Certainly if you are, I wish you could comment on my video and help me to try to find a solution. I even went to Callan Wood because I spoke to uh, a case manager who said that they have a, a psychological... Uh, profile that they can do and after the interview they can write the letter. So I did that and the woman, uh, she's a nurse practitioner, said she was hesitant to write the letter. And I have a letter, it's ironic because my, my primary care physician at Callumwood wrote me a letter, and I'll, I'll read it. It clearly states the following. It's from Callum Wood, on Callum Wood letterhead. 
and it's the patient name is me, Emily Ionelli. My date of birth, January 18, 1961, and it's addressed simply to Dear Doctor. Emily Ionelli has been a patient at Callan Lloyd Community Health Center since April 2012. I am writing this letter in support of Emily Ionelli undergoing orchiotomy or orchiectomy and vaginoplasty. Emily Ionelli experiences persistent gender dysphoria and I am in support of this gender confirming surgery as the next step in her transition process. In order to receive gender-affirming hormone treatment at Callan Lord, Emily Ionelli was determined to have capacity to give informed consent. Emily has major depressive disorder and is in the care of a psychiatrist and psychotherapist. Her current medications include sertraline, 100 milligrams daily, quercetiapine, 150 milligrams daily, and Depakote, 500 milligrams daily. Her current medical regimen includes estradiol, 2 milligrams three times daily, and spironolactone, 100 milligrams twice daily, which she has been taking since June 2012. Please call me at 212-271-7200 with any questions or to arrange follow-up care. Sincerely, Juliet Woodoff, MD. So, my doctor clearly states that in her professional opinion, I am entitled to uh, be considered for the gender reassignment surgery. The problem is that I'm not getting the green light from my psychiatrist and my therapist. And so my back is against the wall right now. And I'm not getting any younger. I just turned 54 on January 18, 2015. You know, I still feel fine. You know, I'm in good physical health. I've gained some weight, which I'm pretty upset about. I want to lose about 30 pounds if possible. And I don't know if the weight gain is attributed to my hormone usage because I don't really eat a lot. So it's very depressing that I've gained so much weight and uh, I really want to lose it. But uh, you know, I joined the gym recently, so I, it's just I don't like the winter right now. So I'm uh, probably going to make use of the gym in the springtime. <clears throat> and I'm continuing with my hormone usage. And, you know, I watch YouTube videos of transgender girls for inspiration. But uh, my heart is broken right now. And I don't know what will be. I don't even know if I'll ever have the surgery. And I will be very depressed over